Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. The fact that she went and found a manager after our OP repeatedly told her, I don't work here, is insane. Who lets these people leave the house? Here we go. Motorized shopping carts are only for employees. I'm a slightly overweight. Okay, I'll be completely honest. I'm overweight. Gen Xer who normally doesn't give many Fs and has anxiety. In stressful situations, I freeze and can't think of anything to say or become snarky. I also recently had surgery on my foot slash ankle and have a hard fiberglass cast. Mine is bright safety yellow because why not? And I told the cast room, surprise me. I decided to Uber to the grocery store for a much needed out of the house adventure and a bonus that included picking out my own bananas. So here I am crutching into the store to flop my out of shape booty into one of the wonderful motorized shopping carts. If you've ever used one, you know that they aren't fast and finding a good location for a set of crutches where they aren't in the way is a challenge. Once I'm situated, I roll over to produce and start my adventure. I'm about halfway through my shopping, pondering chicken and rice recipes when I hear a phlegmy <clears throat> I look to ensure I have the motorized cart close to the shelf, thinking I'm blocking the aisle. Then I hear <clears throat> from right behind me, and it's coming from a woman about my age, if not younger, looking directly at me. Me. Sorry, am I blocking you? I move the cart forward to unblock the shelf of boxed rice. Her. Where are you going? Now I'm confused. Didn't you want me to move out of the way? Her. I need a large bag of dog food taken to the register. Now I'm completely confused. I'm in a motorized cart with a Dago cast on my lower leg and a pair of crutches precariously wedged into the cart. Um, I haven't seen any staff to help. I'll keep an eye out, though. And I start rolling away. That is, until she runs, okay, speed walks in front of me and blocks the aisle in my escape. Her. I need the large bag of dog food. Now. Me. I understand, and I'll help you look for staff to help you. I wait a few moments for her to move out of my way before adding, excuse me. Now she's cocked out a hip and put her hand on it and added a, are you slow, scowl? I put the cart into reverse, the loud beeping, a clear signal I'm attempting to back up. She doubles down. Why aren't you helping me? I need a large bag of dog food. Me. Lady, I don't work here. Mind you, I'm wearing black sweatpants, one leg rolled up over the cast, a sweatshirt with a cartoon monster running in a cartoon street, proudly stating cutting edge monster removal at affordable prices. And to finish up this stellar outfit is a single leopard print slipper and a messy bun. Her, of course you do, that's an employee card. Now I'm looking at her with pinched brows of confusion. Uh, imagery spinning hourglass above my head, trying to compute how a motorized shopping cart, cast, sweats, all add up to one, that I work there, and two, how a cast-wearing scooter-using person is supposed to assist in moving a 50-pound bag of dog food. All I come up with is saying, this motorized cart is for mobility assistance for shoppers who are unable to push a cart and or walk for extended periods. Again, I don't work here. I'm happy to help you find an employee, though. I'm not sure what she wanted, maybe a Karen fight, maybe she was completely stressed. She looks me up and down a few times, her eyes locking onto my casted foot. From our position, my bright day glow safety yellow cast is on full display. She, she mutters something and walks away in a huff. I shrug, my fun time diminished. I normally don't think of grocery shopping as a grand adventure. But when you've been home for a few weeks doing the medically prescribed rest and elevate while you have your surgical cast on, just going to the mailbox is a grand adventure. I decide to roll over to the in-store coffee shop in hopes coffee will cure me. Yes, this store is one of those bougie stores with a coffee shop inside. I actually had Uber driver past a few stores, so I could have had a place to relax and wait for my return Uber. I'm sipping on the coffee when the lady arrives with store manager and points at me. That's the employee who wouldn't help me. Yep, you're right. She doubled down again and pulled in the manager. So starting to go into Karen territory. I could just sit in the chair sipping coffee and let him handle things, or I can add fuel. Can you guess what I did? Did you guess fuel? I raised my hand, wiggle my fingers in a wave greeting, adding toodles, then hunched down like I'm on a motorcycle in a motocross race and zoomed off into the direction of the ice cream. 
I really wanted to make the vroom vroom sound since a younger man was walking faster than my zoom, but I surprisingly somewhat behaved. The internal squealed vrooms, okay, they weren't totally in my mind, were replaced with the Mission Impossible theme song. Again, it might not have been totally in my mind, and I may have hummed it all while I did my best to evade detection by baby Karen. A few minutes later, I'm in checkout when I see manager carrying a large bag of dog food and baby Karen following behind. The rest of my trip was happily uneventful. Side note, I really shouldn't drink coffee that late in the day anymore. Even if you did work there, how the hell are you supposed to grab a 50-pound bag of dog food and a foot cast? Grab a shopping cart and push it to the register your damn self. And our second story. Change your child's fair ribbon? Are you sure? Back in the late 1980s, I was invited to help judge the vegetable contest in a neighboring county for their 4-H fair. Nowadays, we judge the garden entries by interviewing the child, discovering what things they learned working in their garden, and giving them bonus points for nice-looking vegetables. Back then, the job was not quite as simple. Each crop had different score sheets, and different points were awarded for different attributes. Were the tomatoes ripe? Were the beets trimmed? Were they all uniformly sized, etc.? Each scorecard totaled to about 50 points. If a card totaled 45 or more points, they got a blue ribbon. If the card totaled 35 to 45, they got a red ribbon. 25 to 35 was a white ribbon, and below that got a tiny green participation ribbon. Not only did we not get to interview the kids back then, but in fact, nobody was supposed to be in the building with us while we judged. This is important. Anyway, I got started. I was looking at green beans first. There had to be 20 on each plate. The beans had to be uniform, all straight or all curved. Their stems had to be trimmed to less than a half inch. Lots and lots of rules. And I had maybe 40 or 50 plates of beans to look at. I'm working along, minding my own business. I did notice several people walking through the building, fair officials most likely. Most of them ignored me, and so I returned the favor. But one woman, we'll call her Broomhilda, stopped and watched me work for a while. She asked me what the points meant, and I, being a good educator, explained that each attribute was rated 1 to 10, and that this plate got an 8 for uniform shape, a 6 for stem trimming, a 9 for cleanliness, and so on. She seemed okay with my explanation and left. Next, I'm working on sweet peppers. Again, I had 40 or 50 plates to examine and was now rating them for uniform size, uniform shape, uniform color, same number of bumps on the bottom, etc. Broomhilda stops by again and watches me for a bit. She then points to a plate I'd already finished and asks why it only got 40 points. Being a good educator, I explained the points I gave for that plate, seven for not quite uniform size, four for different colors, greens and partial reds, etc. She humped and left. I move on to other veggies, scoring and grading as I go, and every so often, Broomhilda would come back and question what I was doing and why I was scoring what I was scoring. I tried to remain polite and explain what I was doing, but I was beginning to notice she was asking about specific plates. All the names and personal identification were hidden from the judges, so I didn't know whose plate was whose, but apparently she did. I was beginning to get a little annoyed with her constant questions and became more annoyed when she suggested I was being too tough on my judging. That cucumber is trimmed just fine. Why are you picking on that poor kid? At one point, I mentioned that I was supposed to be in the room by myself and that I shouldn't be talking with anyone, and I didn't want her to get in trouble for disrupting a judge. See, I can be tactful. Broomhilda sniffed at me. Don't worry about me. I'm the wife of the fair board secretary or something. Nobody will dare to say anything to me. Fine, I continue on with my judging. After a long while, I was doing my last crop, tomatoes. I was nearly done when Broomhilda swooped in again, and this time with a young boy in tow. The kid was looking around, picking his nose, and altogether didn't seem to care about anything being judged. Broomhilda looked over the plates and then screeched at me. Why did that plate get a red ribbon? What's wrong with those tomatoes? Those are excellent looking tomatoes to me. Now, don't get me wrong, these were perfectly fine tomatoes, if I was going to slice them up and eat them, but compared to the other tomato entries, they weren't quite up to snuff. Certainly not what anyone would call a blue ribbon tomato. She continued screeching at me about how unfair I was being, and I finally had enough. Let me understand, you don't think these are red ribbon tomatoes? No, she snarled. You want me to change the ribbon? Of course I do, she said smugly. 
Fine, I will. And I did. I took the red, second place ribbon, and put on a green, thank you for showing up and participating ribbon. Then I turned to her son. Young man, 4-H is meant to be an educational association and you're supposed to learn something. I hope you learn to leave your mother home next year. And with that, I gathered up my scorecards and walked out. As I was leaving the Garden Crops building, I looked back. The boy was still looking around aimlessly, not caring about anything going on. But Broomhilda looked like a catfish someone hooked and left on the side of the creek, her mouth opening and closing and her throat puffing up like she was gasping for water. I don't think anyone in her entire entitled life had ever talked back to her before. I turned my scorecards in, collected my judge's fee, and never heard a word from anyone at that county fair about taking Broomhilda down a peg or three. You are amazing for this. Side note, sounds like the most boring thing ever to do, though. And our last story. My cousin versus HOA. My cousin bought a disaster of a house in Virginia. It was trashed, but overlooked the James River and was a historic property. Not part of a HOA, but they did have a neighborhood association. More like a group of busybodies with nothing better to do than go around looking in people's yards and finding things to complain about. My cousin's an unusual young woman. She's better with tools than most men I know and is very sharp and has a great job that lets her work from home. The first time she met a neighbor, that were thrilled that she bought the property that had been abandoned for several years and looked it. The yard was large, filled with brush, weeds, and trash. She cleared it, brought in a dumpster, filled it several times during demo. She replaced all the windows, some bad trim, and doors. Since it was a historic property, any changes to the outside had to be approved by the Historic Commission, which is time-consuming. But she plugged through it. The interior of the house is fantastic, state-of-the-art gourmet kitchen, large deck on the back, and well-laid-out gardens. The place looks great. Then the Neighborhood Association comes calling to complain that she hasn't painted the exterior. She points out that she can't paint it until the Historic Commission signs off on it. They have to approve that the colors are historically accurate. A month or so later, a tiny army of painters show up. It's a large house. They painted trim, shutters, did a great job, but the Neighborhood Association almost exploded. They even sent my cousin a letter to inform her that they were going to sue her because the color scheme would devalue the neighborhood and their properties. My cousin told them that as they were not paying for it, they had no say in it. The court date came and my cousin came in without a lawyer. The neighborhood association's lawyer was there and proceeded to make his case. The judge turned to my cousin and was surprised that she had no lawyer. She felt she didn't need one as she offered the judge a small folder of her evidence the evidence was the letter from the Historic Commission stating that the house's original color had been blue, gray, and yellow. It also stated that they would not permit any other colors to be used due to the historic nature of the property. My cousin sold her house this week for considerably more than she put into it, since she's retiring to a large place she built on the Chesapeake Bay. The neighborhood association is no longer operating, and there's a bronze plate stating the historic nature of the home and some of its backstory. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.